Welcome to a special edition of Red, White and Blue. And as you can see, we're not in our studio. We're in Austin, Texas to cover the 2019 Texas Legislative Session. Let's go in. We're here with Speaker Dennis Bonin. Uh, Mr. Speaker, welcome. Thank you. Let's talk about the session. We're in mid-session. Uh, how do you assess where things are at in, in the House under your, in your first term as Speaker? Well, the House has already passed uh, six significant school finance reform, reducing property taxes by $2.7 billion, reducing recapture by $3 billion and putting several billion dollars into public education. And we uh, followed that with a balanced budget that is below population and inflation growth. And we're working on transparency on property taxes uh, so that our taxpayers can see for the first time ever exactly what local entity uh, is looking to increase their taxes and the date and time that they would be voting to do so if they want to go have a conversation with them before they do it. Yeah, I was reading about uh, a bond transparency that is, is, is being proposed in the House. So when bonds are going to be issued to make sure that the voters get information of the impact the new bond issue is going to have on the taxes they would owe. Well, we also have that in our property tax. Uh, reform bill where those uh, bonds where a lot of communities now are simply doing certificates of obligation and they're not even going to the voter. And so we would have those dollars to the taxpayer be counted against um, an automatic election on increased revenues, um, which is not something that anyone else is talking about right now um, because bonds is an area where a lot of money is being spent and they are going around the taxpayer and the voter on those issues in many cases. And of course, those that are voted in by the public would not count against that revenue cap uh, because the voters have said they want to pay for it. Um, but also there is transparency that we're going to provide for the elections uh, when they choose to go that direction. Uh, you know, the, the, the property tax reform that the, the House and the Senate is working on, the House Senate was supposed to go first. Uh, could you explain how this really is supposed to work when we say whatever the, whatever the limit on increase is, two and a half, three and a half, four percent, there's all these different numbers out there, but what does it mean to the average taxpayer? Well, candidly, I think it's been badly misrepresented to the ad average taxpayer. The truth of it is what we passed in House Bill 3, the school finance bill, is true property tax relief. We would compress property taxes by four cents across the state um, for every taxpayer, a 5.5 percent reduction on average. Um, what Senate Bill 2, House Bill 2 actually do is slow the rate of growth. They don't re That bill that the Senate passed yesterday, which we support, doesn't reduce your property taxes. Um, the reduction is seen in House Bill 3. It actually slows the growth of property taxes and it simply creates a, a mechanism where a local entity has to stop at a level of increase. The Senate passed it at three and a half for cities and counties. Um, so at three and a half, they're going to have to stop and have an election of the voter if they want to go above that. Neither of the bills in the House or the Senate are going to restrict the city's, city's abilities or county's abilities to raise their property taxes above that, that percentage that you agree on. They can always go to the voters. Absolutely. The voters, if voters say, okay, you can exceed it. Correct. That's so, exactly right. And, and more, but honestly, um, a significant amount of discussion has been on whether it's two and a half, three and a half, four, what have you, which we support completely in the House. But truthfully, I think the real power for the voter and for the taxpayer is the transparency, the appraisal reform. There is significant appraisal reform in the bill. And the transparency, never has anyone gotten a notice that says, here's the no new revenue rate. This is the rate that your local entity must adopt to ensure they don't get more money from you, the taxpayer. And if they don't want to adopt it, we will show you the rate they're proposing, literally do the math, show you how much more money they're asking of you, and then show you the date, time, and location where they will have to vote to ask for more money from you so you can go and have your voice be heard. Or we actually, in our bill um, on the House side, have where you can automatically click that you have opposition to them going above the no new revenue rate. So I think the appraisal reform and the transparency is some of the most powerful stuff because what I've been saying for years, if I'm a taxpayer, which I am by the way, <laughs> I wanna begin a discussion at a dollar. I don't wanna wait and be waking up at three and a half or two and a half percent increase and then have an election. I'm for that, but I wanna start talking about why you need more money from me at a dollar. 
Yeah, and, and because it's important to, to make sure that the voters know what the politicians are spending money on. Correct. Like. And who's doing it? Because the biggest frustration I hear from my constituents is their property taxes go up. They talk to the mayor, they talk to the county judge, they talk to a commissioner, they talk to the city council, and they all say, I had nothing to do with it. Well, this will finally end that question. Finally, you will be shown with clarity which entity is asking for more money and when they're going to go take a vote to do it. And that's, that is significant progress. One of the other proposals that has come out over the last couple of weeks is a, a swap, yes. uh, property tax relief for an increase in the sales tax. Can you tell us the genesis of that? Uh, that's a discussions that the governor and the lieutenant governor and I and other leaders have been having since December. And uh, the reality of it is, um, I think that the sales tax is a broader, fairer tax, more inclusive tax. Um, and the, the truth of it is, if we want to drive down property taxes, which we absolutely want to do here in the Texas House, um, you have to find a way to replace that revenue for our schools. And so by swapping um, dollar for dollar an increase, a one penny increase in sales tax, you can drive down property taxes by about 10 cents. Um, that's a pretty significant reduction. You couple that with the four cents of compression that we have in House Bill 3 that we've passed. You look in the Houston area and across the state where we've added $3 billion to reduce recapture for Robin Hood districts. You're now talking about more dollars staying at home and less of a tax bill on your school taxes. You're from the, obviously from the Houston area and, and you, you had to live through Harvey like all Absolutely. of us did. What, what are you all working on the, this session to, to address Harvey, future Harveys? We have a, a large package of legislation um, that I'm very proud of because it absolutely addresses a future Hurricane Harvey, but what it really does well is it addresses future disasters that could hit any part of our state, and the state being better equipped and, and better set up to respond wherever it happens in our state, God forbid, we know it will, um, we're better prepared. And we have entities ready to go to work and do the job. And they, we are removing whatever legal barriers that we found to be uh, a hamstringing in Harvey to, not, to be removed so that we're better prepared. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the issues that'll be on the floor tomorrow here in the house is you know a lot of folks when they're in a mandatory evacuation giving them the ability um, to frankly not worry about carrying their guns with them um, evacuating from their home um, we actually allow that when you're in a mandatory evacuation you're now free to move about the state um, with the guns that you may be taking from your home um, as you're taking other important possessions um, with you um, to protect them and for protection. Because in many instances, uh, when we have these disasters hit, you're in a mandatory evacuation. You're not exactly sure where you're spending the night. Um, we, I don't want to remind anyone of this, but there's been some very difficult evacuation stories. Fortunately, we haven't had those in the last couple, thank goodness, where people have been stuck on the side of the road. They've been stuck in, in uh, campsites that they didn't count on being on. Um, so we've got a large package of emergency recovery bills here in the House. We did a package last week and we're doing our next package tomorrow. Does the state have an increased role because flooding and natural disasters don't necessarily confine themselves to a city or a county? They do. Um, one of the things, that, though, that we're being careful, um, that's a discussion this session that hasn't been resolved yet, is helping local entities with their local match to get federal dollars. Um, in recovery dollars. Um, one of the issues, though, that's important to me is that I think the state, that's something the state's never done before. I think the state should only be doing that for communities that, frankly, just don't have the money otherwise, um, which candidly would mean Harris County and Houston has the resources to match locally um, to get the federal dollars. But Rockport, who was hit just devastated by Harvey, I think we all start to forget Rockport was the eye of that storm. Um, Rockport doesn't have the dollars for a local match. So we're looking at how to help communities who truly need that help and that support. But you, you've seen where in Harris County they passed a record bond for flood control and the state's working on those issues, not just with Harris County, but around the region. How do you find the role as speaker different from the, the role you've had as previous sessions? You've been in the House a long time, been a committee chairman for a long time. Uh, 
kind of let our... Well, the difference is, is that um, as a committee chair or a voting member, one, I don't vote as speaker, uh, except for rarely. I voted for our budget. And I voted for House Bill 3 because school finance reform is the number one issue for, for our house um, and for the state. But the difference now is that I really um, am here to help make sure the members have a successful process, that every member has the opportunity to be heard. Um, that doesn't mean they succeed, but they get heard. Um, and as a member, my job was to advocate for a specific issue, and I voted, and I'd debate, and I'd argue, and, and what have you. Now my job is to make sure that those debates and arguments are done respectfully, um, and that every member walks away, whether they win or lose, uh, ready to come to work the next day with a positive attitude towards their colleagues, and so that we do good things for Texas, we get to a solution. Uh, I've been telling people throughout, my job is to make sure that I don't tell the members the answer to the, to the question. My job is to make sure the members get to an answer. Um, we put members in a room and say, okay, work this out, come to an agreement. Our job is not to tell them that answer though. Well, thank you, Speaker Bonin, for taking the time from your busy schedule to visit with your, your constituents, which by the way yes. are now all over the state of Texas. Yeah, that's right, thank you. We're here with Senator Paul Betancourt on Red, White, and Blue, two days in Austin, Senator, uh, welcome. Road trip. I'm glad you all finally made it. Well, we are too, and it's been uh, most enjoyable, I can say. One of the things that is common to all the kind of things you're working on with property taxes and the things related to that is, is the Texas tax system. And I know you have, have commented in the past about our tax system being created basically in the 19th century. So uh, is it time for Texas to take a look at how we tax and, and so we make sure that we have a system that doesn't break people like property taxes are, you and know, also gives government the, the means it actually needs to do the work. Very great question. I had senators come up the day after SB not, SB two passed. Sorry, the property tax relief, with exactly that type of question. We should look at that in the interim. Now we did get some help for small businesses out. You know, one thing that kills small businesses is time. So we've raised the, their exemption. Uh, from the Senate side so that if they only have $2,500 worth of furniture fixtures, they don't have to turn in paperwork anymore. And that puts a U.S. grant in their wallet too, you know. But it's time that kills people. That's part of the tax. The question is, how much time does it take for compliance? And we're, we're looking at all of that, but we're passing out some really good bills uh, about government efficiency as well. Um, so we've gotten off to the best start we ever have since I've been in the, uh, the Senate. This is our third try and it's a charm um, because this is the best, by the way, major property tax relief bill holding, holding uh, increases on last year's tax levy to 3.5% for non-school taxes, 2.5% for school taxes. That's really, that's really earthquake level of, uh, of, of tax relief. Now, but the, the, the local governments, school, a lot of the school districts have been lobbying, as we've seen them in the halls of the legislature, because they don't want to see something like this pass. Now, is, are they being unfair? Because the, this system does not lock them into this tax rate. They can actually get the people to approve see, it. See, that's the they? key thing, is whatever limits there now, okay, they can take it to the voters. Look. People shouldn't be afraid of the voters. I don't know why Texas Municipal League, Texas Association County is so afraid of this bill because they shouldn't be afraid of their voters. Look at the Houston pension bond. I, I had to fight to get that vote in. Senator Huffman put it in uh, her bill. It, it, uh, you know, the mayor was still fighting it. Um, it goes to the public and the public passes at 77 to 23. Let the people vote. Anything that votes touches the tax rate should be voted on in November. We've had bills that are already out of the Senate on that. And also, we, by the way, another great bill, Senate Bill 702, that's mine. How about pure transparency on all lobbying? Everybody that comes from a, uh, from a city or county, we need a line item on their budget. We need to know how much they're spending. And I want it reported to the Texas Ethics Commission you know, subcontractors, lawyers, whatever else. My guess is that it's it could be $200 million that's being spent on lobbying. Well, they could be spending that on education or and on city tax services. relief or whatever else instead of wasting it on, on governmental lobbying. Well, one thing we have learned uh, going through the halls of the legislature, there are sure a whole lot of lobbyists here. <laughs> Senator, uh, the time is up. Thank you so much for visiting with us in Austin. Of course, we'll have you back on the show in Houston 
as one of our regulars. I've got more more bills to go. <laughs> so whenever you want to talk about it, we uh, you know. Well, we'll, we'll do we'll do a report at post session, <laughs> and when we look back and see what did we really accomplish, what we did, and the work we have to do. Well, thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. We're here with State Representative Harold Dutton of, of, of Houston, District 142, uh, an important member of the House, number three in seniority now. Right. So welcome to Red, White, and Blue. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's good Harold, to be back. Harold, let's talk about, uh, what's, we're mid-session. How are your priorities going? Things are going a little bit, yeah, I guess, all right. I mean, I've, I've been here long enough to know that you never get too excited about the highs and don't get too depressed about the lows. Uh, uh, your main, one of your main priorities is juvenile justice? Yes. What's going on there? Well, we, we passed the bill out of committee last week, uh, which raises the age at which juveniles can be um, charged with adult crimes from 17 to 18. State, Texas is, a, is one of four states that still does that, that still treats 17-year-olds as adults when it comes to criminal conduct. And I think juveniles who are 17... I mean, you and I both have had 17-year-olds, and, you know, uh, we shouldn't be holding them um, criminally responsible as adults, because I think 17-year-olds still haven't gotten that thing. And one of the things this legislature has done this session in the Senate, they just passed a bill to raise the age for smoking from 18 to 21. That's interesting. So yeah. she thinks maybe juveniles should be treated as, a, as young people a exactly. at that age. In fact, there are a number of states that are considering raising their, their juvenile age to 21 from 18. The theory behind why the age should go up is what? Well, actually, the law in Texas was passed 100 years ago oh. in 1919, making juveniles at 17 uh, eligible for adult crimes. Uh, and so this is one of the laws we haven't paid in a long time because we just have simply done nothing about it. Um, but the fact that most states, 50, you know, 46 states don't do what we do, that is hold juveniles at 17 responsible as adults. Thank you so much for your time, no, Representative Dutton. You. Keep up the good work. Thank you, and thank you for being here always. We're here with Dr. John Zerwas, uh, State Representative, Chairman of the Appropriations Committee from the Southeast Texas region. Your hometown is? It's uh, Richmond. Okay. It's well, uh, kind of the whole Richmond, Katy area is what I call home. Well, that's part of, that's our home too for Good. Houston Public Media, PBS in Houston. You have a huge job, Chairman of Appropriations. I mean, isn't that like the biggest job next to being Speaker? Well, uh, it's, it's a significant job for sure. Uh, it's a large committee, the largest in the House, uh, and also has the largest staff available to us. And so uh, the, the state really spares no resources in terms of people in jobs to help us get this done. And then there's a whole thing called the Legislative Budget Board, which is uh, probably about 200 people that serve strictly to help us make sure we can get a budget across the finish line. Because as you probably know, the only bill constitutionally that we are required to pass is the budget. So we could pass one bill and all the thousands of others that we file don't matter. As a doctor, you have a personal knowledge about the uh, medical system that operates in Texas. Uh, are you given any thought to what we need to be doing to have a more effective and efficient medical delivery system in the state? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really big issue. <laughs> we'll do you know? a whole show on that. <laughs> so you could do many shows on that, you know. Um, but I do think that to deliver a more uh, cost-effective, high-quality healthcare system, you do have to make some major changes that come in terms of how we deliver care and how we get paid for care. And I think part of it is is that you know people have to have some kind of financial vested interest in their health care. Now, it shouldn't be something that breaks the bank, but all of us should have some financial vested interest, and most of us do in the private marketplace you do. Um, but by the same token, uh, and I think that drives some better decision making on behalf of us, all of us as patients. Uh, but in terms of my side of the desk where you know I'm delivering health care and stuff like that, uh, we really need to adopt and embrace the idea of quality care and being paid for quality care. Uh, you know, this is 
you know, uh, termed a number of different things, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, quality needs to be baked into how we get paid. And um, that right now is something that's happening kind of piecemeal in places, but it hasn't really been fully adopted. And I think until we do that, um, you know, the incentive is still to just be productive as opposed to really being invested in how we deliver care. And the other part of that is, is uh, making it a, a way for people to make money in doing preventive care. Uh, right now, preventive care is something that is not well paid for in the system. And so we know that you know, for every dollar we spend in some kind of preventive effort, we're gonna save $5 down the road in some kind of care that typically would come to me as an anesthesiologist. So. Well, Dr. Zerwas, it was a fascinating discussion. We'd love to have you back to have in-depth discussion about how to reform medical care in Texas. It, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, thinking about that in here as well as out in, in the med medical practice area. Well, thanks for spending the time with us. I appreciate Thank you. it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Representative White, uh, welcome to Red, White, and Blue. Yes, I, I, I get get around and looking at you every now and then. Well, I, we appreciate I that. I made it to big time, Red, White, and Blue. You have, <laughs> and, 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 and you're, you're in our viewing audience, your district. Where, tell us where your district well, is. Well, we're, we're right outside your viewing audience. I believe I have one county that may be in, in your uh, viewing audience, that's Polk County. So we're proud to represent Polk, Tyler, Jasper, Newton, and Hardin counties. I believe, uh, Tyler, Jasper, Newton, and, and, and Hardin, they're either in the um, uh, Beaumont or, or Lufkin uh, media well, market. Well, we're glad to, glad to have part of your district yes, sir. with us. Yes, sir. Uh, this session, you're chairman of the Cor Corrections House yes, Corrections sir. That's Committee. Yes, second, second, second session as chair. That's obviously very important. Uh, corrections are a big part of the budget. Yes, it is. Uh, about a little over $7 billion for the biennium. Uh, you're talking about 146 incarcerated, justice-involved individuals. Uh, maybe 146,000. 146,000, excuse me. Yes. Uh, another three, 400,000 on probation or parole. Wow. So it's a very fascinating committee. We oversight everything from the time someone is convicted and possibly if they face the death penalty. Uh, and, and you've been one of the leaders in terms of common sense reforms in this area. Common sense conservative reforms that uphold the Constitution, obviously fiscally conservative, and, and, and if important, and this is important, um, it, it renders a bit of compassion foremostly to victims and also those that have an intersection with the criminal justice system. So what are you working on this session? We're working on a lot. Uh, it's a big old agency, or we're getting our agency ready for their sunset, but obviously we had to deal with this issue of upholding or stressing the uh, common sense and dignity of women that are incarcerated. Uh, we were um, highlighted on, on just some issues as their hy hygiene equipment, uh, how we are engaging with these women, how we're rehabilitating them, how we're educating them. Uh, the committee is very, very um, concerned that when we look at the education of these women that are incarcerated, uh, their programming is not up to par with the men that are incarcerated. So we've been working on all of those issues, strengthening our probation system. Uh, the probation system in your local community, Gary, they're your force multipliers. Uh, they're working with people in the, in the community, they're rehabilitating them, and we find out on certain offenses, especially these low-level uh, possession drug type offenses, they're able to uh, do that rehabilitation more efficiently and effectively. Have you found that uh, spending more money on probation in local-based programs gives you more bang for the buck than spending money to incarcerate people it, it, in maximum security prisons? It, it has the potential to do that. Obviously, uh, one of the core um, objectives of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is to promote public safety. To, so to the extent that we can, um, in, a, in, a, um, in a very uh, informed way, look at someone's criminogenic uh, needs, or look at their criminogenic behaviors, yes, we can be more effective and more efficient with some offenses um, especially those that are, that are dealing with addiction. Um, some environments, like a prison environment, may not be that great as far as handling 
and addiction, uh, usually we need to get those folks into some type of therapeutic environment. Have, have we given any thought to not having every Texas Department of Criminal Justice facility be maximum security? Well, kind look, of like the feds do it, where they yeah. have different levels of well, prisons. Well, I think we, I think we do have different levels of security from unit to unit. Uh, understand this: when I uh, first started my journey here in the Texas Legislature, uh, we were, you know, between maybe 150, 255,000 incarcerated and justice involved. Now I think we're about, like I said, 146,000. Right now, we have vastly more violent offenders uh, that are. Uh, incarcerated, many of them, uh, 30, 35 percent bottom line floor number, are, are, are struggling with some type of psychosis. So, so Gary, look, um, uh, at varying degrees, you know, we have varying degrees of security, but when it comes to security, we really lean on our uh, folks in TDCJ, the uniform folks that run these units from day to day to give us good advice and on, on that. Well, thank you so much for taking yes, a few sir. minutes to visit with us, Representative James White. Right. Hey, great to have you in the Capitol today and um, get, us, get us going in the right direction. Well, I will say this, you are hardworking, we can tell. <laughs> hey, thank you. Okay, thank you, Gary.